Do you do the intro while I'm uh, going Welcome to-, to Free Associations. Matt is furiously typing at the Just timer, pushing buttons. hammering on buttons randomly, hoping that something will work. Welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by the way that bad data is being used are. against us. Are being used. Data are. <laughs> no. You are so right. Well done. Thank you. My dad would be pleased about this because he was obsessive on this point. Because the most important part of that sentence was the grammar. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Uh, what were you talking about again? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I went down I went down the rabbit hole of listening to a podcast where he had on one of those uh, anti-vaxxer guys, mm. pro-ivermectin guys. And what what really struck me about the whole thing was the way that they, you know, we've talked about this on this podcast before, isn't, they don't just sort of spout off crazy things that have, you know, no basis anywhere. They use bad data. So they they, they cite studies and and then you get, you know, get people saying, well, there are studies. How can you dismiss studies? Well, you know, we know there are plenty of bad studies out I, there. But I've published plenty of those. Exactly. You are the problem here, Chris. I just, I'm, <laughs> I'm the I'm, author of all those <laughs> ivermectin studies. I'm, Dr. Gill? I'm increasingly concerned about the way that bad data is being used against us. So I'm going to leave it at that <sighs> rant over. So for anyone who does not know, I'm Matt Fox from the Boston University School of Public Health Department of Epidemiology and Global Health. And I am joined once again by friend and colleague, Dr. Christopher Gill. Technically, that would be department's. Yeah, uh, uh, I would. I would love it if uh, if you would let's correct. get our plurals right here today to Matt. Matt, this is this is this is what I need. I this need is a datum point. A d- <laughs> oh no! You know, interestingly enough, do you know this? I was a, an English major in college, really? and yet I'm, I am. I will perfectly. I'm terrible with grammar mm. and. Things like this, but I was actually a, an English major. Anyway, I thought you were a math major. I, for so many years, I was sure of that. Not a math major. Mm. Could have could, thought about it, but I thought about uh, minor in math, but I never, never bothered. Majors are bigger than minors. Mm-hmm. Right hand carrot. Uh, no idea. No idea. Well, welcome, Chris. Hi, Matt. <laughs> And also, Dr. Jess Liebler from the Department of Environmental Health at the Boston University School of Public Health. Welcome, Jess. Thank you. And as a reminder, head on over to the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthex.org. We find BU's hub for lifelong learning, all kinds of interesting, fun activities, public health tools and programs. And go on and check that out. So let's head on to the show. So today... In our first segment, which is our Journal Club segment, we're going to look at a study on the impact of adding HIV self-testing kits to partner HIV notification. And then the second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive, we're going to talk about confidence intervals in interpreting non-statistically significant results, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. So I appreciate that you guys are willing to go along. And then in our final segment, our amazing and amusing, we'll get into some things that make us laugh out loud or just fascinated us. So let's do segment one. So we're going to talk about an article, as I said, that looked at the impact of adding HIV self-testing kits to partner notification. It was published in the Lancet Global Health, and it was entitled Addition of HIV Self-Test Kits to Partner Notification Services to Increase HIV Testing of Male Partners of Pregnant Women in Zambia to Parallel Randomized Trials. A mouthful, fair enough, but it was by first author Wilbrod Mutale of the School of Public Health at the University of Zambia. And I suppose we should probably say, in the interest of full disclosure, I have done a tiny bit of work in Zambia. But Chris, you've done a fair bit of work in Zambia. Yeah. And I'm trying to recall, I don't think I know Dr. Mutale. Yeah, I don't either, but I know I know some of the, the senior author and some of the other authors on this paper, but I uh, don't know, don't know, don't know Dr. Mutale. But anyway, there are there we picked this one because it was of interest to us. So there, I don't have any headlines on this. I looked and there just wasn't much to report. So Jess, can you talk us through this study? I can. Thank you, Matt. So just by means of background for a minute, prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV is obviously a key public health priority, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, where HIV is highly prevalent among adults of childbearing age. And involving male partners in health services is seen as a key way to improve healthcare access during the prenatal period and more generally. So improving family health, family health access generally, and the period of pregnancy has been 
identified as a potential way to draw families into healthcare services more generally, with a focus specifically on increased access to HIV testing and the goal of preventing mother to child HIV transmission. So male partner, as I said, male partner HIV testing is identified as a key way of promoting family-based healthcare utilization. So these authors had an interesting research question. It was focused on whether the provision of self-test HIV kits, so these are our tests, obviously, these are HIV tests that you can uh, use yourself to determine your HIV status. If giving these kits to pregnant women to in turn give to their male partner for them to use, for the male partner to use to assess their HIV status, if that would improve male engagement with healthcare services among couples at risk for mother-to-child HIV transmission. The specific endpoint of this study was whether providing these kits to the pregnant women affected facility-based HIV testing, which is valuable in and of itself as confirmation for the self-testing, also as a proxy for future potential engagement with healthcare services. So what these authors did is they initiated two parallel unmasked randomized trials in Lusaka, Zambia, enrolling pregnant women who were seeking medical care at the clinic. So the first trial, and the trials were very similar with one key difference. The first trial included women who were all HIV positive, who had been diagnosed before their pregnancy. And this trial included 116 women. The second trial included women who were HIV negative at the first prenatal visit, and this trial included 210 women. Within each of these trials, there was a control group and the intervention group, and the control group was offered at the start of the study the kind of standard package of options in terms of support for partner notification for their HIV status that are included for all women in this at these clinics who seek medical care during pregnancy. So these included counseling to pregnant mom is as of ways that she could encourage her male partner to come into the facility and get tested or different methods of having the clinician contact the male partner directly to try to encourage them to come into the clinic to get HIV tested. So that's kind of the standard of care at this moment in time are these different options, and the control group was offered those standard options. The intervention group was offered the same standard of care as the control group, plus they were offered up to five HIV self-test kits to directly deliver to their male partner in the hopes that these uh, partners would use them to assess their HIV status. And the outcome was male partner HIV testing at a healthcare facility within 30 days after the study visit, the study visit being the enrollment of the mom in the study at the clinic early in her prenatal care. Secondary outcomes they looked at were any HIV testing, including the use of the self-test kits, as reported by the um, woman participant. And also they were interested in data on intimate partner violence to see if potentially this intervention of encouraging the woman to give her male partner HIV self-test kits might be associated with increased intimate partner violence. So what did they conclude? In both of the trials, um, the HIV testing by the male partner in a facility, a healthcare facility, was lower in the intervention group. And so that's the group, again, that was provided the HIV self-tests compared to the control group with a stronger effect observed in the second trial, which had the women who were HIV negative. However, the proportion of male partners who underwent any testing at all, including the self-tests, increased in the intervention group as reported by the pregnant mom. And it increased, and any testing increased by 41% among the women who were in the positive group versus the control group, um, and by 23% among women who were in the HIV negative trial. And so the overall suggestion of these authors in their conclusion is that providing self-test HIV kits allowed people to test at home which they did, and so they were tested more frequently than they would have otherwise, but they typically did not follow up with confirmatory testing at the clinic, so the overall level of engagement with healthcare services was reduced through the provision of these test kits. Yeah, interesting study, uh, and I really, I have to say, I enjoyed reading this one. It does come to a conclusion that maybe this is actually not increasing the desired outcome, though I suppose it depends on what you consider to be the the desired outcome. Also worth noting, you said this is an unblinded trial, unblinded because it's very hard to blind right. people as to whether or not you gave them a HIV test kit. So, right, so this is one where they can give them, you know, 
fake kits, yeah. but that would be a little exactly unethical. Yeah. Exactly. Now I suppose you could give them something else, you know, that would would might also motivate seeking, you know, seeking services just to see if there was something about giving somebody something versus giving them specifically an HIV test. But I, I you know, to me that's a, a pretty small point. Chris, what was your take on this one? Well, I was really curious, actually, for to, to, for your reaction to this, because it struck me that at least sort of philosophically, what they were doing was much akin to the kind of work that you and Sydney have been doing in, in South Africa, which is to say, looking across the, the spectrum of care and the, the cascade of care and trying to find opportunities to remove, you know, systematic structural barriers one by one and just to make the whole thing easier and yeah. less burdensome. And, and and it seemed like that that's basically what they were trying to do. Yeah. So I, I thought that was, that I, I, so maybe I'll stop there and ask you how, how you reacted to that before I go on. Yeah, no, I think this is, was a really good idea. I mean, I think, think anything that we can do to make the the burden on the on the patient less we hope is going to improve access to services and increase linking to care and initiating care unfortunately it seems like this didn't work as intended but i think the idea was was you know a smart idea yeah, it didn't work as an intended in the sense that they intended this to lead to an increased rate of PCR testing to sort of formalize the diagnosis of HIV, where what it instead did was significantly increase the overall number of men who were tested, but most of those who were tested opted just to use the rapid diagnostic test and not to go further. And and so I suppose on the one hand, it's like, that's a pity that it didn't lead them to PCR, but on the other hand, it's entirely predictable that that's what right. would have resulted, because it just seems like human nature, you know, particularly if you start with the female partner, the pregnant woman has just tested negative. And so now the husband goes home with, you know, five RDTs and tests negative. So why would you think that they would go to PCR? I mean, like, why would you, right? I mean, it just seems like now the whole issue of HIV is really effectively been removed. And so that's no surprise. Yeah. And then amongst those who are HIV positive, I thought it was like, you know, it basically tripled the rate of the men getting tested. And so, yeah, they didn't get tested by PCR, but they got tested by these extraordinarily accurate at RDTs, it's important to, to recognize that these tests are like 99% sensitivity and specific. So compared with PCR, there, there's, they're not, there's not much more accuracy that can be bought from doing it formally. And, and it, you know, and so then you could say, well, you know, perhaps the downside is that many of these men will then, because they did this on this own, on their own time, would not then follow through and get linked to care. But actually, that's not what they found. They found that many of them did, that the, you know, eight out of the 12 individuals who were, or eight out of the 12 individuals who tested positive in this group, this is shown in, in one of the tables in the back, followed through and got linked to care. All right. You, you take a second and, and find that number for me, because yeah, so to me, is, that's the, the sort of the crux their, of the argument. This is in their figure five. So they report that they were, you know, amongst the male partner HIV test results where they had a, a, a result reported, 13 turned out to be HIV positive. And of those 13, ultimately eight of the 13 ended up getting linked to care who presumably would not have because the testing rates in the control arm were so low. That you, you'd think that probably, you know, basically it also had the, the advantage of bringing more men into the, into the HIV care system. So I, I thought that was, that was a, a, you know, a, not a perfect home run, but, but moving in the right direction and not as, and it didn't really validate the main fear that they would just avoid further contact with the system. Yeah, that's an interesting, because I'm, I'm, I want to go back to that because it's, that's, that is not something that I took away from it when I read it. But you're right. I mean, my read of this was the reason why it's problematic isn't if people take the home test and then they don't come, you know, go get confirmatory testing isn't because we're worried about the person who tests negative. It is true that there is a chance that it's a false negative, but that's always true. Very and it's small, very though. rare, right? It's, it's, so we're not from a, on a population level, if we're going to roll out an intervention, we wouldn't be particularly concerned about that, but it matters for the positives because if the positives test positive, but don't link to care, then, you know, that's useful information to the person, but overall it doesn't, achieve the goal of getting more people onto treatment and especially not only getting them onto treatment, but getting them onto treatment faster before they're... They can spread further or, or be harmed by it. So, so I was concerned when I read this that it was decreasing that linkage to care issue. And, you know, you can see how there may be some social desirability bias in the secondary outcome question of did you test at all? Because if you give people a test and you tell them, you know, go home and give this to your partner. And then you say, did you do this? You know, most likely they, they're going to say yes, even if they didn't. 
and so it seems to me that's not the most trustworthy outcome. But if if they act, are in fact getting the positives to link, then it seems to me it's a it's a win. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I, I had a couple questions that I that I was hoping that they would answer, and maybe I just missed it in the fine print. But I didn't understand why they gave five tests. Like, what were what <laughs> were was, they it was to up ch- to five tests? Up to five and tests. So I almost thought that was just as many as they had. Like that was, it was unclear to me because the vast majority of the women, I, I thought about that too. The vast majority of the women only reported one sexual partner. And so uh-huh. ostensibly, unless you're asking, so you know, maybe that's what it was, unless you're asking the, te- the, you know, your partner, like, no, take a few, <laughs> you know, take this test five times. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that makes a lot unclear. more sense. I, I, I was thinking it was more a one-to-one ratio, but that, of course, that's not necessarily true. Right. So maybe that's why. Uh, um, plus, you know, yeah. you can also botch a test. Like I remember when we were going mm-hmm. on holiday and I had to do a, a rapid diagnostic test for COVID on my son. The first one, I like, I totally messed up the instructions. And they're expensive. So, it's so upsetting. Yeah. So you want at least two. So you can, you can get the first one, you know, make, make it, you know, blow the test and, and then, then you can tr- do it again properly. Maybe do, it, so. to, yeah, do, but, do all our listeners <laughs> in the rest of the world where COVID tests are, mm-hmm. the home tests are cheap and or free, just want... To let you all know, they are expensive and hard to find here, and it's really upsetting. Sorry, Jess, I interrupted you. No, I was going to say, I mean, what I liked about this study kind of conceptually, even though it maybe didn't pan out in the in their overall estimates. You know, the idea that you think like more information is better and Mm -hmm. for people to have easier information about their own health is better. And then the decision is up to them if they choose to seek for their care, like kind of it puts it in their hands, like having this information, then that's, that's a decision point that you can make as an individual, you can make with your family kind of what your next step is. And that seems better than not having access to that information at all and being able to do it in a way that promotes confidentiality and privacy for that person rather than maybe walking into a clinic someone might be uncomfortable with taking that step but maybe they would take the test in the privacy of their own like it's it seemed like it should be a benefit even if it doesn't kind of pan out that it necessarily draws people into the clinic more it seemed like there's a social and personal benefit to having the ability to, to take this test at home, especially if the test exists and it's such high quality. Yeah, yeah I suppose the, the question becomes, it's sort of a trade-off, right? If you, if you have the information and you choose to do something with that information that leads to fewer onward infections, even if you don't go to the clinic and get on treatment yourself, maybe that's a net benefit. If, on the other hand, you get the information, but all you have is the information and now you haven't linked to care uh, you don't get on treatment, and you also don't you know, change your behavior. Right. Then is it a lost opportunity? But it, you know, it seems to me, Chris, what you're saying is that many of them did link. Now, I would say st- the study was it, this was not a large study, and then when you further limit to just those who tested positive, there's really not. You, we, we can't say that much about whether or not it did or didn't do anything really for that population. But it's it's encouraging. Mm-hmm. I agree. I, I I felt that there was an interesting comparison with. You know, many, 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 many years ago when we were doing the LUNESP study. And one of the things that, that we That was had, a study that Chris ran. It was a study I ran, but Matt was was uh, the senior analyst on the, on the project, did all the statistics for us. And Matt was present. And Matt was present <laughs> and did a lot of the work, as did Bill McLeod. I was going to say, Bill was, the, Bill was the senior analyst. Maybe I, was, I, I helped. helped. You guys helped. Anyway, you were part of this too. And uh, <laughs> it was a nice little study. And one of the add-ons we did, which didn't work at all, was to instruct the traditional birth attendants who were seeing these mothers before before they delivered and forming that relationship that would then carry forward to the delivery of the child itself, one of the things we tried to do was to train them how to use HIV rapid diagnostic tests Mm -hmm. as a way of of targeting which mothers and baby pairs would maybe benefit from perinatal uropine uh, prophylaxis. And so we did these series of training workshops and the, the traditional birth attendants did really well on w- figuring out how the, how the mechanics of the test work and going through mock counseling sessions. And in practice, it totally bombed. Mm-hmm. And, I, and it, it seemed at the time, this was back in around 2007-ish, when you know the, the future of, of HIV antiretroviral therapy was very much uh, still in doubt and access was very limited, that the traditional birth attendants were, were extremely reluctant to actually take the responsibility for knowing the the HIV status of their neighbors and for providing this information. So in practice, they just wouldn't do it. It was too socially fraught, I guess is the right word, to, to do mm-hmm. this. And, 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 and now here we are, you know, 15 years later, approximately, and people are handing out self, you know, test kits and they're being used. And it is not 
you know, at least they reported here that there wasn't an increase in intermittent intermi partner violence as a consequence of the test results, which was one of the things that they were afraid of. But in fact, it just sort of actually had been somewhat normalized and people accepted it and did it. And mm -hmm. it wasn't it wasn't as, as sort of terrifying, I guess, as it was 10 years ago. Yeah. Or, so, yeah, I would add on that. I mean, I I was interested in there. There was actually one woman in the intervention group who reported intimate partner violence as a result of asking her partner to take these self tests. And I am less familiar with this as a research area, kind mm. of HIV in sub-Saharan Africa. And it's something that if I were reading this as a reviewer would have given me pause, kind of the idea of do you put the responsibility in the hands of the pregnant woman who already is very vulnerable to violence? And the studies, this study they excluded at the beginning women who had a history of intimate partner violence. But I'm sure those, you know, the kind of that data is imperfect. And that, that worried me a little bit in reading this study, that there was one woman in a small study who reported that she, she you know, that there was violence imposed on her because of this study and because of being asked to gather this information herself from her partner. And that gave me pause. It felt uncomfortable kind of reading it, that maybe this wasn't, this wasn't the best design or maybe the idea of shifting the burden of this information to the pregnant woman, given all of the risks that pregnant women already face from partner violence, was not uh, was not the best idea, and so. But I'm unfamiliar with this research area, and maybe like you're saying that these self tests are something that are very well established in the community and kind of not viewed as as something that is concerning or that men would feel offensive if their partner was like, I think you need to take one of these self tests. Chris, uh, you've you've worked in these some of these communities. I don't know if you have any more insight on that. Well, I think that what Jess has said is is absolutely correct, that, you know, these communities are extremely poor. The women are really at the economic mercy of their partners. The men Some. are almost always the money earners in the household. HIV is still highly stigmatized. And the concern that, you know, a wife, a mother to be, you know, discloses she's HIV positive could lead to violence. Is, is, has, we've, we've seen that before in other, mm -hmm. in other in studies, for sure, that this uh, this is a, you know, really a, a potentially explosive situation that we're asking them to put them in. However, with that said, it, you know, I just want to remind that the, the current standard of care is that all the women go through this process of, of facilitated disclosure. And so it's, no, it's not that it's standing solely on the HIV rapid diagnostic test that the partner is receiving, but it comes in the context of this whole series of counseling sessions. And so maybe that, that, that changes the risk calculus a little bit. Right, right, maybe. So uh, just a couple of issues I wanted to raise about this study. So two two things of interest to me. One is that they the the outcome that we were talking about here, which is that did you get a any HIV test didn't necessarily have to be facility based, was an outcome that was added later on. So this was not an outcome that was initially mm -hmm. one of their you know primary outcomes. I, it may have been an outcome. It may have been a secondary outcome. But they sort of I think it was in May of 2020 they at added a second outcome of any testing. So that's after I think the data was certainly deep into the study if it wasn't after all the data was collected. So enrollment finished in May of 2020. Uh, so, you know, does that, does it concern you at all that that was added after the fact? It doesn't really bother me. I was just feeling like that data was probably less valid in general, because I, especially again, as I was thinking about violence, you know, women who might have any concern whatsoever that this approach might not be well received by their partner was just going to say, yeah, he took it and he was negative. And, and so there was a strong incentive to just report, mm -hmm. uh, report, you know, that way. So I wasn't sure exactly what to make of that outcome. Yeah, I, I share that concern. I, it's interesting because the reason I'm posing this question is because obviously there is this movement around, you know, registration of studies and, and declaring your outcomes. And it's not that you can't add outcomes later on, but you would you need to disclose that, which, of course, they did. I don't I don't know that I have a problem with it. I mean, I do think there is part of me that says, OK, it wasn't what they originally set out to do. So I'm going to sort of discount it a little bit in my mind, but at the same time, like, I'm not sure it's, it, but it, not enough that I'm going to say, oh, I, I certainly, you know, it doesn't make me concerned in the sense of, oh, you know, anything nefarious going on, you know, but I, but I also have this, this feeling like you, Jess, that, that I'm not sure I, I totally trust that outcome quite as much just 
not because it was added later, just because it's self-reported data. And, and you know, there's reason to have a little bit of, of suspicion there. The, the other thing I just wanted to point out was, and I can't remember if this is the first or second study that we've looked at, where they actually had to change their protocol due to COVID. Right. So mm-hmm. they actually had to, you know, deal with the fact that we were doing research, ongoing research in a an active pandemic where you couldn't necessarily have the same contact with with partners. I don't remember specifically how they changed it. I don't know if either of you do, but it was a it was interesting that this was you know we're dealing with real life here and situations where you have to adapt to the the situations that you're in and you know make plans and you know that seems to me something that just had to happen. I know. I think what they did is they kept their original 30 day study period, but they allowed the women to report after that Mm -hmm. period Mm -hmm. when they were next in the clinic, if they couldn't make it in that 30 day period. Makes sense. Yeah. But it's interesting. I think you're right. I think there's, there's obviously going to be tons of studies that had to adapt on the fly during the pandemic that were kind of deeply reliant on direct participant contact. I couldn't do that for a period of time. Right. And then the last thing I just want to raise is it's worth noting these were not large studies. And so while they were, you know, they were randomized. There were certainly imbalances between their arms, and they did do some adjusted analyses, adjusting for age, age difference between the partner, travel time, things like that, to, to sort of deal with, with some of those imbalances. So while it was a, a randomized trial, it didn't sort of have all of the, you know, features of a, of a large randomized trial. But still, again, not enough that it makes me concerned, but I just think it's worth noting. Any other, any other issues anyone wants to raise on this one before we move on? No, I'm, I'm good. Let's talk confidence <laughs> intervals. So segment two. So I am deeply, deeply overjoyed that we finally are getting to talk about confidence intervals. This is based on a, a JAMA article called Use of Confidence Intervals in Interpreting Non-Statistically Significant Results by Alexandra Hawkins and Lauren Samuels. And, you know, just to set this up, essentially this is this is making the argument that, you know, focusing on, on p-values has problems. So hopefully we are moving into or have moved into the era where we focus on confidence intervals over p-values. In confidence intervals, we can actually focus on the effect size and the confidence interval that is around the effect size. And they are getting into this issue of what do we do with non-significant results where, you know, the p-value essentially can tell you whether something is significant or not significant, something that I'm, as you all know, I'm less interested in. But the confidence interval tells you about the precision. And if we really are serious that we care about null results, that it is actually useful to know if one thing does not cause another, then knowing something is null is only something we can truly infer when we have precision around that null. And so the idea here is that we would really take seriously the confidence intervals around our estimates. And regardless of whether or not we find a significant finding, we'd actually focus on what that interval is telling us. If it's you know, a, a large effect with a wide confidence interval that is not significant, we can still focus on the fact that it's a you know, large effect, but it's very imprecise. Whereas if we have a very, very, very tiny effect that is statistically significant, so it's going to have a very narrow confidence interval, then we've learned there's probably not much of an effect, but we we may have you know extreme confidence in that finding. Uh, we're going to get to that next week. We are when we talk about oh, hypertension. Sure, next absolutely. Week. In two, two weeks, two weeks. in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I can't wait to come back in two weeks and, <laughs> and chat with you about that. So let me start. Let me Jess. Let me start with you. Do you use confidence intervals in this way? I, I, I do. I mean, I think increasingly it's common in the, in the epidemiologic literature to focus on the confidence intervals. And I think specifically, you know, those of us who work with certain colleagues. Who shall rename, who remain shall, nameless. Right, right. I'm sure, Matt, you're one of them. But if you're listening, them, you know who you are. <laughs> you know who you are, Dan Brooks in the epi department. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of focus in this area and moving our research in that direction, all for the better. I think, you know, the the environmental health literature, which I typically publish my papers in, are still very p vo- yeah, p-value oriented. And so, and they want to see the p-values and, you know, the confidence intervals are important, but sometimes the p-value still remains the threshold for, for, comp- for what you can re- really comment on. 
or what the, you know, the reviewers want to see you discuss. I think one of the interesting things that came out of this paper to me that I don't usually think about is they call it the... Compatibility. Oh, I was going to say the minimum oh, clinical sorry, sorry. important difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Sorry. Like if you don't do, if you don't do clinical research, which I typically do not, the idea of, you know, you have your finding and you have your estimate and you have your confidence interval. And the idea like, does that mean anything clinically is not something I typically think about because I'm usually doing population health studies is or you know kind of not not studies that are involving this clinically relevant difference but obviously in thinking about it it's very important you could have a significant <laughs> finding in the context of you know whatever your research is that that just doesn't mean anything clinically and so i thought that was actually one of the more interesting points that came out as i in my mind as i was reading this i i just have to comment i've been working with a doctoral student in your department who's taking class with me. So he, he I knows know, my I know. Opinions. I'm a co-author on that paper oh, right, and right, I saw right. your commentary. And your doctoral student has I'm, literally been indoctrinated. I'm <laughs> deleting all of the, the references to significance and I the, know. the p-values. Yeah. That's right. I forgot you were on that paper. <laughs> Chris, what's your, I mean, what's your take on this? Sure. Before I forget though, at some point I'd like you to tell me the difference between confidence intervals and credible in- intervals. Compatibility. Co- uh, mm. Well, people also talk about credible intervals. Credible in- intervals is, is when you've moved into a, a Bayesian framework. Is that so, what it is? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's the same thing except complicated math. Different and the difference is interpretation. Okay. Very fair enough. So I thought this was, you know, for those who don't understand about confidence intervals, I thought that this was probably a very helpful little paper. And I would encourage people to read it because it's simple and it kind of makes a, a clear and point. Short. And it's short. For those of, of the listeners who don't have the paper in front of them, which I assume is 99.99% with, you know, high <laughs> the degree confidence of, of confidence, <laughs> it, it all hinges on this figure that they show where let's imagine that you, you have an intervention which could have no effect or it could be harmful or it could be helpful. And let's say that this, this clinically meaningful difference would say 10% harm versus 10% uh, helpful would be your interval. And, and so you could have a study where the confidence interval is within that plus and minus 10% of harmful and helpful. And, and so you would say that the data do not resolve the question about whether it's harmful or helpful because it's symmetrical and it's within that interval. But you're confident that the true effect is within that interval of being you know neither clearly helpful nor clearly harmful, but potentially either. And then you have a much wider confidence interval that goes beyond that plus or minus 10% of harm and help. And that, you know, expresses a much you know, higher degree of ambiguity as to whether this is doing anything. Or you could have a situation where the tail is not symmetrical within those two confidence intervals, but actually, you know, falls into the harmful or the helpful area, but only on one side, in which case the preponderance of the evidence is, either, is it now includes the possibility that even though you can't prove it's helpful or harmful, it, it actually, the evidence suggests that it is more likely to be one of those than the other. And depending on what that thing was, if it was a very important thing that you wanted to know, you might say, well, golly gee, we need a bigger study to follow up and do this because, you know, it seems that we could be missing a great opportunity to do something very helpful here based on the data we see, even though the p-value is greater than 0.05. And, and I, I just think, you know, that is, it's so simple to see it that way and yet so profoundly more helpful than just drawing a line in the sand and saying you win, you lose. Totally agree. I mean, it helps us think about data beyond simply the, the world of significance and to say, what does the data actually tell us? And they talk about this idea of compatibility intervals rather than thinking about confidence intervals. Same, you know, same math, but just saying rather than focusing on confidence in which you know, many of us were taught confidence interval means I am 95% confident the true value is in there. That is, of course, an incorrect way to interpret a confidence interval because we can't be 95% confident of anything in a 95% confidence interval. We're 95% confident in the method. The method gets it right 95% of the time. But if you if you throw all that out and you just think, let me look at the interval and think about what is the data compatible with. With decreasing compatibility of the data with hypotheses that get closer to the edges of the interval, and they don't go to, you know, it doesn't drop off to zero once you get outside the interval, but it's just sort of a helpful range of values to think about compatibility of my data with lots of different hypotheses. None of it is conclusive, right? It's not because it's in the interval, it's meaningful, and it's outside the interval, it's not. It's just giving us a sense for how much, you know, I'll say evidence, it's not quite the right word, but how much evidence the data provide for different hypotheses. And Mm -hmm. I just think it's a so much more valuable approach than just saying, if it's significant, it's meaningful, and if it's not significant, it is not. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, very helpful little analysis. Other other thoughts or, or comments on that one, Jess? I was just thinking, I was reflecting on my time teaching in our intro quantitative methods course. 
Mm -hmm. over a number of years here at BU. And this ends up being, you know, teaching confidence intervals ends up being one of the most complicated and challenging things that we teach. And there's not consistency, you know, in our class, we have teachers in, you know, who teach this class who are from the epi training, you know, epi training. And there's also biostatisticians and there's people who have environmental health training, which kind of crosses the two. And there's no one set perspective among the whole group of teachers. For example, people have different perspectives in terms of how, you know, biostatisticians still see strong value in significance testing in the in the traditional way. And as even as epidemiologists have moved away from it, and it is difficult to teach. Confidence intervals are a difficult concept. It's you know, anything that involves probability, for example, is not is not easy to teach. And I think some of the reliance on the p value is just because it's a it's easier to understand. It's easier to teach, and there is complications in trying to express express what this paper is expressing in the classroom. So actually, I would have people read this paper. I think it's a nice one. It's it's not hard mm-hmm. to get through. And the graphic, I think, is fabulous because it really depicts their their key points really clearly. Many years ago, teaching the course of math started many, many years earlier than that, uh, GH702, which desperately needs to be resurrected. I think it's, it was such a great course. You, you've brought that up several times on this podcast. And I, 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 I guess I keep playing t- with the idea of like, maybe maybe I should or we should resurrect it and teach it again. Because it was, well, anyway, in, in that course, one of the things I, I taught them about was the misuse of confidence intervals for doing sequential comparisons of an intervention. So we're all you know familiar with the commutative power of equality, that if A equals B and B equals C, that therefore A equals C. But when you use confidence intervals, you can violate that. Mm. That is to say, like, if you were to do a non-inferiority analysis of treatment A versus treatment B, and A was the, the, you know, the standard of care and B was the, the, the newcomer, B would want to be non-inferior to A, and it would be based on an analysis of confidence intervals, that the, the minimum effect based on the confidence interval of the delta between A and B had to be above some threshold to, to sort of basically say they were effectively the same. So let's imagine that you had this sort of series of drugs being introduced. Let's you actually use an exact, uh, a true example like tricyclic antidepressants which were the original first class of antidepressants. They were, they were relatively more effective, we think, than the current generation, but they had serious, serious side effects. So there was a lot of interest in finding better uh, antidepressants. And so the first, like, Me Too drugs were the Prozac-like drugs, which had to prove non-inferiority versus tricyclics, and, and, and they succeeded. And then came a third generation of antidepressants, which, which now, because mm. the Prozac-like drugs had become de facto the standard of care, had to prove that they were non-inferiority to Prozac, and they were. But the question is, are the do those mm-hmm. data show that the third generation are not inferior to the first generation? Okay. And actually, they don't because of this issue of the confidence intervals. And it, 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 is, it was, an, I think, an intentional misuse by the, the, the drug development mm. companies to use the statistical you know, assumption of the commutative power of equality mm-hmm. to their advantage to essentially license less and less effective antidepressants mm. <laughs> you know, over yeah. several generations. That's a really interesting point. Mm. So... The last thing I do want to say is you you mentioned the the challenges between communi- you know the way that things may necessarily be taught in a, a biostats department yeah. versus an epi department. I do want to give a shout out to our biostats department because I have I have they do obviously they do continue to teach p values, which is of course you have to. I mean, students have to know what they are and and how to interpret them. But most of the folks that I talk with in the the biostats department have you know largely I think moved away from them as a as a you know at least in the way you sort of using them as a uh, it's significant or non-significant. I suppose the one exception that might be, and I don't know this for sure, but the fantastic chair of the biostats department can tell me if I'm wrong about this, would be in genetic epi, hmm. where I think p-values are often used. They're used in a different way, but I mean, you need, if you're going to be testing the whole, you know, every gene against some kind of, you know, a disease, you do probably need some kind of a screening process, you can't focus on every single one. And so they, you know, there you look for very, very low P values rather than just a P less than 0.05. But, you know, in general, I, I, I've been I've been impressed with the the move away from it's P a values tool, and right? I mean, the p value sure. is a tool, and what we've we've basically been you know banging the drum and saying for years is that it's a tool, but it's kind of an unnuanced tool, and it lacks sophistication, and we can do better. Yeah. So and and in in the right context, when the assumptions are all met, and you can have a useful, you have a good reason to use it, that's fine. But I just feel like in most cases, confidence intervals will give you the same information and more. Mm-hmm. We might as well use it. Cool. 
All right, let's move on to our third segment, the amazing and amusing. I'm going to go first this time, and I'm curious to know, do you all do you use these like guideline checklists when you're reporting your studies, like the strobe statement? I mean, obviously, the consort statement, if you're going to do a randomized trial, you have to use. But other than that, there are so many of these checklists that, and, and guidelines. Do you use I, them? I have never yet used them a priori. I have so many times used them because the journal insisted on me doing it post hoc. Mm. Exactly. I've, had, I've done the same thing where the journal says you have to submit the completed checklist with your manuscript. And that's, those are the times the when I've time. done it. Mm. And then you're like, because you're, you know, you're sort of used to it, you, you know, check, 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 mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So I, we could probably get into a longer discussion as to whether we should be using them more. But I, the question becomes, what what do you do when you have a really underwhelming study? Mm-hmm. There's really no checklist for how bad, you report un- science. underwhelming studies. Well, good news. <laughs> no, the Christmas edition of the BMJ is out. <laughs> and they have an article uh, on the biased outcome reporting guidelines for underwhelming studies. The, <laughs> the bogus <laughs> statement. <laughs> so obviously this is the Christmas edition. Uh, this is by Dr. Greta Bauer. And I'll just read you a, a few pieces of this. So bogus 2020 aims to move both underwhelming research and reporting guidelines forward by introducing the concept of precision reporting, which updates and replaces older terminology such as selective reporting and (laughs) massaging the results. (laughs) The biased outcome reporting guidelines for underwhelming studies initiative was established in May of 2021. However, given the year from hell that 2020 was, it seemed more appropriate to name them after that year. Given a year of pandemic isolation and the resulting inability to convene even one more group over Zoom, the initiative coalesced into a vast effort undertaken by a single individual with at least 22 different opinions. (laughs) Face-to-face meetings took place over the first two days when one participant, two computer video methods produced shrieking audio feedback, mirror-based meeting methods were used, which involved asking repeatedly, why? Why, COVID? Why? Why reporting guidelines? It continues on like that. Mm-hmm. It's, I thought, was just what we needed at the end of 2021. You know, one thing that I, I find particularly annoying with these proliferations of, of, of new things that you have to report in every paper, yes. this one is in The Lancet, which is the in the section, what does this study add? Yeah. And they ask you to put in the PubMed search strategy you used at the beginning of the project to provide the background literature and the rationale for the study that you've just done. But I'm just like, wait a minute, that's so rarely how I do I things. I know, I know. Like, I never sit down and say, okay, I'm going to do a PubMed literature so I can publish in the Lancet in four years. It, it, right, a systematic <laughs> review, basically. I mean, come on, who are they fooling? Yeah. I mean, it was, this just seems like totally ridiculous. Anyway. I, I've, I've always found that one to be a challenge. Yeah, well, like, what are you supposed to say? Yep. I do think that there's value to think about, like, what do you do at the end of the day if you have a study that's underwhelming? And, <laughs> right, which happens a lot, like a lot, especially Mostly. early in your career. And then, you know, you have small sample sizes and maybe your confidence intervals are super wide and they're going, you know, from negative numbers up to 300. And like, you know, is there a checklist for you to decide even like, is this worthy of publication? Well, like, what do I do with this totally underwhelming study that I just spent five years producing? We uh, concluded right? the world <laughs> is still round. <laughs> Like, like, there's a lot of research that way. Like, not every research is, like, is amazing. So, and you, find, right. so you want to propose that I this, this get I, yeah. taken out of the Christmas edition <laughs> and turned into a real... A checklist for, like, you know, you have an okay study. Like, the, it, the <laughs> meh guidelines. Meh guidelines. Meh. That could have some real value, I think. I think it's a fantastic idea. I'll have to put that together. All right, Chris, what do you got for us? Well, I am sure that our readers are well aware that readers? today... Do we have uh, listeners, readers? Listeners, <laughs> excuse me. There may be some readers, too, if it's being transcribed. Today, uh, December 17th, 2021, is the 251st anniversary of Beethoven's birthday. Mm-hmm. Um, last year, we talked about Beethoven we, on we, the 17th it feels like of it December. Comes up very often, yeah. yeah. So we're going to talk about Beethoven again, but this time I want to f- focus on on the, one of the mysteries of Beethoven's history, which is why he died. I mean, he died. He was quite old, mm-hmm. uh, so he was entitled to die. But he died in a, in a very <laughs> unfortunate, and his, his his final demise was was pretty gruesome. I mean, he had a basically multi system organ failure, mm. and people have been perplexed as to what what did him in. And and so I, I was given this book a couple of years ago, which I only recently got around to, to reading by Russell. 
Russell Martin entitled Beethoven's Hair. And it, it's kind of an interesting, though sometimes a bit long-winded, uh, <laughs> exploration into a set of forensic analyses based on a snippet of Beethoven's hair mm. that was taken from his deathbed by a young musician, a fellow called Ferdinand Hiller in 1827, just after Beethoven had died and was put in a little glass locket mm. and passed down as an heirloom through his family, eventually lost, and then found its way into a, in, into Denmark in an open market and was, you know, saved from the Nazis as they were coming through Denmark and finally made its way to Sotheby's in London, where it was purchased by a pair of Beethoven aficionados, one of whom's name was Alfred or Albert Guevara, but he goes by the name of Che Guevara, literally. Anyway, these guys did a, a forensic analysis on, on, on this hair. And before I, I sort of give you an answer to it, I'm going to just describe that the locket contained 582 hairs. The young Ferdinand Hiller was 15 years old at the time of Ludwig van Beethoven's death. And when they eventually got around to doing an autopsy on him, and I'll actually read a autopsy list of, on, the, on, on the hair. On Beethoven. <laughs> on the Beethoven. So this was oh, a Beethoven contemporaneous yeah, yeah, autopsy. Okay, so so in, in life, Beethoven had been famously ill with this sort of panoply of conditions. He he had, quote, rheumatism and colic, and of course, deafness was what he was most famous for. Kidney stones, hepatitis, cryopathy, which is uh, probably chillblains. This is like a vasculitis when you get cold. People have been getting it in COVID, like COVID tolls would be, would be an example of chillblains. Skin disorders and abscesses. Now, based on that, all sorts of folks have, have posthumously postulated about what Beethoven died of. Some said he died of a morphine overdose. Some said it was syphilis, which is very popular amongst classical composers for some reason. Some have said he had sarcoma disease. Others said the, the, this was all irrelevant and he just had an acoustic neuroma. And some thought it was um, some sort of uh, skullduggery. So, skullduggery. He, so he actually was autopsied. And I'll describe what it says. This is, this is the contemporaneous This autopsy. is the contemporaneous on an autopsy Obviously by Dr. Do an Andres autopsy hundreds of years later. Yes. in 1827. He found that Beethoven's liver was shrunk to half the size of a healthy one, was leathery and covered with nodules, that his spleen was black and tough and twice its normal size. The pancreas, too, was unusually large and hard, and each of the pale kidneys contained numerous stones. The deaf man's auditory nerves were shriveled and marrowless, whatever that means, but the nearby facial nerves were impressively large. The auditory arteries were dilated to more than the size of a crow's quill. That's the way I'm I not entirely measure. sure that's, how I know what crow's quill is. That's how I measure or things. Or how big it is. Yep. It's, it's kind of like, what's the name of this? How many, how many uh, stroops or whatever it is, that guy? Who, oh, um, uh, the guy? You're talking about the MIT the Bridge. The MIT Bridge. Uh, oh. blah, blah, blah. What's it called? Uh, uh, oh, it's yeah. not smurf. So this is smoot. 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 How many smoots yeah. is it across the bridge? Yeah, so we, we, we need to explain that quills. for the listener. There is a bridge that connects Boston to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and there is a unit of measure that was is demarcates the bridge called a smoot, which is the length of a person called smoot named smoot mm -hmm. laid out across the bridge multiple times. Anyway, yep. so crow's quill is a new measure of, of diameter, I guess. His arteries had become surprisingly brittle. The bone of the skull was strangely dense. This is an important clue, actually. And the rem and remarkably white and fluid filled convolutions of the brain were deeper, wider and more numerous than the physicians expected them to be, whatever the heck that means. Now, I already know what it is so based on that they, description. So this is what they they ended up doing. They they did a, a series of forensic analysis. They looked for morphine. They didn't find any morphine. So they figured he didn't die of morphine poisoning. Wait, you're talking about now the hair analysis. The hair analysis. This is now 200 years later. But what they did find is that Beethoven's hair was impregnated with 50 times the, the toxic level of lead. Hmm. Mm. And amongst his artifacts were a whole series of, of pewter um, lead. and, yeah. and lead-containing ceramic, yeah. ceramic drinking glasses. So he died of lead poisoning? And so he probably died of lead poisoning. And lead poisoning, of course, is famous for causing neuropathy, right. which would align with the autopsy finding, with bone uh, deposition leading to unusually dense bone, abdominal pain, anemia, kidney failure, and kidney stones, uh, hepatitis, and gout. Mm. So a lot of the, the, the findings that they described at autopsy and that were sort of syndromically reported by mm. Beethoven during life, actually are totally compatible with lead poisoning. What do you know? The more you know. How cool. That is fascinating. So, I mean, maybe that's right. what done it. It seems uh, totally plausible. Hmm. That is interesting. All right. Before I pass it over to you, Jess, I have to say, it just occurred to me that I think if you go back and check the archives, that is the second time in this podcast I've explained what a smoot is. <laughs> yes, I think I'm it is. pretty sure I did once before, didn't but I? But not everybody listens Nick, to every episode, so this is really important. Nick says yes, so it's, it must be people. true. 
<laughs> All right, Jess, what do you got? Oh, I have something that is not as interesting as Beethoven's okay. hair and lead poisoning. However, this was something where I was just reading some headlines, and this is is a research study that was conducted at Rice University and somewhere else too. It looks a oh, University of Wyoming. It was a collaboration mm-hmm. from researchers at Rice University and the University of Wyoming. And the headline caught my eye. It said, "Swirling bacteria mimic Van Gogh's The Starry Night," Ooh. the painting. Oh wow! And so I was like, "Okay, that's kind of interesting. I wonder what that's about." So I was I, I, I read this kind of brief about this article and then looked at the actual article itself. And actually, the research has absolutely nothing to do with Starry Night. <laughs> and what it has to do with, you know, these researchers, they were, they were working with this bacteria called Myxococcus xanthus, and they were looking at how the bacteria clumps. Like it kind of clumps as an a, a, as a measure of aggression and then also a measure of defense, and so it kind of swarms. It has this swarming characteristic, which is how it takes over space and kind of consumes other bacterial competitors. And so the researchers, that's really what they were interested in. In this kind of it was the swarming behavior and what was causing the swarming behavior. And so you know they were doing all kinds of things. It was like a very scientific paper. It was published in I think in M Systems, the American. Society for Microbiology's core journal, one of their core journals, and they were looking at like how it swarms. And so in the context of looking at these swarmed clusters of bacteria, they were taking some photos, as people who do, you know, microscopic words, you know, tend to do, and then they were kind of playing around and adding different colors to it. Okay. And so in the context of adding different colors, they added the color palette of Van Gogh's The Starry Night, and it became like a a mimic of the artwork. And then that became the selling point for the research, <laughs> right? And so they, they include this, you know, they include this visual, which was a cool visual, but that really wasn't at all what they were was going for. The that was not the point of the article, but they got a lot of publicity because of it. And so it was it's really interesting. Idea. So I was, I was reading this. I was like, what an interesting thing to do if I come up with some sort of, you know, interesting I don't know, my research results in some kind of painting or something. You would get much more publicity. Right. I thought it was actually kind of clever. And like which, it, which is the metric that right. we're all going for, let's be honest. It does look like the Starry Night, but That's that, so that cool. really wasn't, you know, they were doing actual serious research about this bacterial behavior. Very cool. Very cool. Well, that is the end of our program. If you've got any feedback on this or any other episode, or you want to suggest a study or a topic for us to take on, you can tweet us at at PopHealthyX, or you can tweet me at at Prof Matt Fox, or Don at at DTheo1, or Chris at ID.Gill, or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthyx.org. We want to thank Leslie Talali, an assistant dean of lifelong learning at the BU School of Public Health, for supporting the podcast, and Nick Guler for sound editing and remembering every single episode of the podcast, including the fact that I've said that one before. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. And we hope you will download our next episode. So long, Smoot. Smoot.